Welcome to this session on diagnostic genetics and transfusion medicine, particularly as they apply in high value to the rhesus blood group antigen system and to the Duffy blood group antigen system. So the reason we pick these two systems is that Duffy is one of those guys where you can seem to be negative serologically, but actually have a genetic background that predicts for some tolerance. And so your genotyping adds value here in waiving a compulsion to match for something you don't actually need to. And then on the other hand, conceptually, the converse concept, where in a number of RH antigens of apparent expression, you can seem positive and yet be vulnerable to seroconversion. So when we attack the RH system, our objectives are going to be to explain the significance and the difference between being so-called RHD positive or negative. We're going to go over the concepts of weak versus partial D. We're going to go over the difference between ISO and alloy immunization. Appreciate wiener diversity and ancestral patterns. And showcase through a number of examples partial alleles to get a better understanding of them. And also really illustrate the role of blood group genotyping here. When we flip over to the Duffy side, we're going to talk about the Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines gene, how that maps to a protein, a protein that has function, and what the clinical implications are for the presence or the absence of that material on the red cell membrane. We'll go over the connection between the GATA promoter mutation and the differential tissue expression in so-called apparently red cell null to non-red cell conserved expression. And we'll talk about these intriguing antibodies called anti-Duffy-3 and anti-Duffy-5, antibodies that land not on the tail where you have the determinant of your Duffy A versus your Duffy B type, but on these more public epitopes that may be enzyme resistant. So let's take a big step back. Now, what do we mean by a phenotype? Phenotype usually connotes a serologically determined antigen expression profile. But when it comes to us handing out phenotyping cards, i.e. statements of what a person's expression profile is, we should appreciate that this may have been come upon by a true serologic means or by a genetic test that predicted that expression. Now, typically, we have an integration of both inputs. We get adult patients coming to us from pediatric centers, and a lot of the time, historically, they will have had serologic typing done, or in their presentation to us here, they may have been serologically phenotyped because that's the fastest way to get a result, and we needed to know the profile quickly. But eventually, because this is still a slower turnaround test, we will be submitting genotypes. And then from the genotypes, seeing what the expression is expected to be and, and checking out to see whether or not there's concordance in so-called geno-pheno correlation. So this is a, a phenotyping card that gives you clear positives and negatives as to the presence or the absence, respectively, of the listed antigens on the card. Now, I want you to think in a two-by-two two way. Usually, when we say there's geno-pheno correlation and there's a clear mapping and there's no confusion, you can be serologically D-positive and have your genotype concur. That would be your example of a wild-type D-positive individual. You can be phenotype negative on your typing and have a genotype that comports that way. So a clearly D negative person that would be denoted by the little d, little d. Or, as in the first example, you can appear to be negative for the Duffy B antigen, 
but still have expression in other tissues. Now, you can't predict that from the red cell phenotype, but you can surmise that the Duffy B gene may be homozygously present with a GATA promoter mutation. And so we use the section sign here to connote someone who appears to type negative, but in whom you would still predict tolerance based on a genotype-informed profile of the patient. Flipping conceptually the other way, you can have someone who phenotypes positive. You might have a clear big C type, but this big C positive person can make an anti-big C. And that would be an example of a variant that makes them quote-unquote partial. They are at risk of alloimmunization because their version of big C is not equal to the big C wild type. And so when they process that big C wild type, they might get offended and make an anti-big C wild type specific antibody that is different from their version of big C. This is an antibody that's not going to land on themselves. It's actually an allo antibody, even though in the sign out, a person who would type as big C who's made an anti-big C would give you the illusion of an auto anti C. This allo anti big C is not binding on themselves. And so this is the phenopositive but genotype predicted to be negative or altered individual. And this is a person who, if you catch them genotypically, you can save from that zero conversion by giving them a different marker. This would be, for example, big C star. And that would be our local convention for denoting the seemingly antigen positive but not tolerant version of a big C expressor. So in essence, we really, at the end of the day, need to integrate the genotyping with the serology and the clinical picture to come up with the best possible transfusion recommendation for the safest care of the patient. And so blood banking has moved when it comes to these nuances from antibody-based typing, the serologic era, to the deeper dive of molecular testing, known DNA polymorphisms that are picked up by probes that are specific for them in this engineered kind of diagnostic catalog and get more sophisticated than that. And get agnostic, so to speak, with next-generation sequencing. So you can actually look for the DNA sequence without presupposing what the SNPs might be that map to specific antigens. And so this is, this, this is sort of your discovery mode. Yeah, you can confirm that you have known SNPs that define known antigens. But you can also pick up new variants that may explain your patient's case. For example, someone whose D genotype looked normal on molecular testing, but who through next generation sequencing gets a pickup of a novel variant that now explains why that seemingly D positive person with a normal molecular test nevertheless made an anti D. So, next generation sequencing gives us obviously a lot more information. So in this history, you know, we pull out DNA from the nucleus, and in the old days, we would figure out if someone was variant by just seeing if their DNA cut differently from a wild type. So restriction fragment length polymorphisms with restriction endonucleases. Then there was allele-specific PCR, and then real-time PCR with sequencing and microarrays, so ways to get really high throughput and efficient. It's still best practice and interesting to see, again, what the geno-pheno correlation is. I encourage you to visit this link to decode such reports, but this is the format of the reports you're going to see on this rotation and in the rest of this seminar. Now, we were quite early adopters, even before these manufacturers got their chops and approval to 
do the work. And for about $80, uh, we were able to get a pretty good genotype that gave us as much information, actually more information than the standard kind of Big Ten phenotypes that we would be able to run in the lab. Serology is not cheap, but if you can get a genotyping result that is cheaper than that panel of 10, and you get more information, uh, well, then you've got a cost-effective offering. This wonderful review by Connie Westhoff in Blood gives some comparisons between antibody-based typing and DNA typing. So though DNA typing is slow turnaround, you've got automation. You can work with a sample that comes from any cell source. You have no interferences serologically from competing opsonins and molecular crowding on the working red cell surface. You can detect weak or partial antigens, and you can figure things out at pretty high resolution. So benefits of genotyping, you can type patients for numerous antigens in a single test. Again, you can overcome the confounders or limitations that you would face serologically from recent transfusion or pre-coding with immune globulin. Someone with warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is much harder to phenotype, especially if you're using phenotyping assays that are IgG-based that require another layer of anti-human globulin. So if you're using anti-human globulin, as a confirmatory layer to see if your reagent has landed on an antigen. Well, that's going to flash up positive on you if your red cells are pre-coded with nonspecific warm auto IgG. You can type patients receiving monoclonal antibodies, anti-CD38, anti-CD47. If you don't have commercial anti-sera for specific antigens, your genotype can give you that information. If you have obstetric patients, and you want to give the best possible de-stratification care, calling them positive or negative, or determining if you give Rh immunoglobulin and relegate the patient to Rhd negative cellular product support. This is going to give you your best answer. You can resolve typing discrepancies. You can even figure out zygosity. Uh, you can take maternal serum, free fetal DNA, to infer non-invasively a fetus's antigen profile to predict for HDFN or FNATE uh, and get the most accurate RH antigen matching information for sickle cell disease care. So we've covered before that our matching options in the standard sense run as basic as the two-way ABORHD match to the five-way prophylactic antigen match to the extended antigen match, which includes KID, Duffy, and S-typing. And as I mentioned, if you have an IgG-based typing reagent, as is the case for our Duffy and S-typing tools in our blood bank, which rely on a top layer of anti-human globulin to see if the typing reagent has landed on the antigen. You can't do a Duffy or S-type in someone with an existing warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, so you can't get that extended antigen match. You can only go so far as kid typing, and so you've got something in between a partial and an extended match in those cases. Okay, now let's ask structurally and functionally, what is RHD, RHCE? So the base Rh gene went through a gene duplication in evolutionary history. Uh, the first transcript was actually the 3 prime, 5 prime RHCE gene. And then you had a gene duplication to form RHD, which runs 5 prime, 3 prime. It's actually not unusual in nature to have some genes running in reverse direction. You could see here that there is an upstream box and a downstream box. This is going to come 
in handy in a few slides down. So genotypically, the D and the CE gene sequence sit on chromosome 1P. And both the D and the CE gene consist of 10 exons, obviously very similar to each other because of that duplication event. So this is the DNA side, the transcription side, to these similar structures, these 12 transmembrane pass molecules. These are 97% identical. There are two other members in the five-member RH family. There's also the RHBG and RHCG gene. And you have RAG, the RH-associated glycoprotein, expressed on chromosome 6P11, where you have a bit less homology, maybe 33% shared. So in other species, if you look at the phylogenetics, there's a lot of RH subfamily expression across numerous species. And what they do in others is serve as an ammonium transport channel. But the human version of these RH genes, of these mutations, have led to probably a non-functional molecule, though there's been this idea that RH has some channel engagement, probably confounded by the fact that these materials are so structurally pieced together like a puzzle on the red cell membrane. So you've got this band 3 complex and 4.1R complex. I like to call these the structurome. These are like the pegs of a tent, where the tent is on the inside of the red cell, the cytoskeleton. The thing that gives the red cell its tent segrity structure is adapted into these pores or kind of pinch points on the red cell surface. And such a nexus ends up actually being a channel or a transporter for bicarbonate. Uh, the structure of band three is as an anion exchanger. So transmembrane glycoproteins, glycophorin A, RH, RAG, they all bind to band three and CD47 and the LW or Landsteiner Wiener antigen also associate with RH and RAG. There was confusion over LW and RH back in discovery times. And a structural role is implied by the instability syndromes that you get for the lack of these major proteins. And as I said, confusion over the pore function, the ultimate story of attribution by association. So band three, what it does is chloride in, bicarbonate out. And here I'm highlighting the RH molecules in lilac. So RH assembles with RAG, those are the purple bars, with the pink of a D and a CE protein. Uh, this is a hetero-oligomeric complex, some post-translational modifications with complex polysaccharides hanging like hair off of the sides here. But this is essentially what an RH complex looks like. So a heterotrimer. We only have reagents for the detection of five principal antigens. We have reagents for D, big C, big E, little c, little e. But appreciate that because the D and the CE protein have these long sequences with lots of exofacial loops, that you have an opportunity by mutation or variation to produce new or different antigens that may be immunogenic if they're shown on the donor side or vulnerability producing if they exist on the recipient side because this makes a recipient different from the wild type version. So you will have through the RH system, if you have variants, if that's the assumption, which proves to be true, uh, 
that you have this capacity for lots of partial alleles or variant alleles with the vulnerability to sensitization, autoimmunization, rather than the formation of autoantibodies with apparent specificity. Now, the way I think of the CE protein is as Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse's head specifically. The C and the E type that you have, even though we have typing reagents to tell you what C type or E type you are, this is not to say that these are separate proteins. They are actually facets of the same molecule, but just different parts of it. And so these have extreme linkage. Your C type cannot be regarded separately from your E type. You inherit a combination because you inherit a specific CE protein. And thus, a C and E type together. So where are these D and C E types in terms of Wiener ethnogroups? So D and C E protein give you a bunch of different combinations. The original Wiener type is what you would call R naught positive for the D and the CE protein in the little c, little e version. So two small ears on Mickey Mouse. The Eurasian Wiener ethnogroup is classically RHD positive, but instead of the little c, that ear is mutated to the big c version. So it's the first change. The first change from the original is going from little c to big C. So if you are D positive, big C positive, and little e positive, the other ear is a small e. You are called R1. There is another ethnogroup that is positive for D. Little c stays little c on the CE protein, but the variant that happened in this ethno group was little e becoming big E. So if you're a D positive, little c positive, big E positive, that sequence, that DCE combo is called R2. And we see this as uh, an Amerindian genotype, uh, but we can also see this in Mediterranean Asia Minor ethno groups. The rarest of these is where both the C and the E are both big C, big E. So if you are D positive, big C positive, big E positive, you are RZ. This was probably a recombined allele between an R1 and an R2 historically to form an RZ. Now if you are little c, little e, your version of the CE protein presents what is known as the F, as in Frank, antigen or the F type. The little c, little e version of the CE protein can be immunogenic if transfused to someone who is an R1, R1, or an R2, R2, because their version of the CE protein is a big ear with a small ear. Okay, so if you're seeing two small ears at a joint antigen sense, that CE protein looks different to you. So making an anti-F is something that people who are R1, R1, R2, R2, R1, R2, and so on and so forth. So negative for the little c, little e, cis arrangement. That is something that these people are vulnerable to making. What is D dash dash? Interestingly, that's a state where you have the D protein, but you completely lack the C E protein. So you have no C or E type to speak of. You are neither big C nor little C, nor big E nor little E. So this is a C E gene deletion on both inherited haplotypes from mom and dad. And this is quite rare, very different from how common being D negative is. Now, how did we get D deleted, the more common version of a D or CE 
deletion historically across humans is actually a de-deleted state. How do you pick that up genetically? It's not like you're sequencing the whole D gene classically. A lot of our molecular work is SNP probe based. And so the way we could pick up an entire D deletion is by looking at the proximity of the up down box sequences to each other because it implies a cutout. So this up down box becomes informative as a unique arrangement that gives away the classic. D mode of negativity that exists in 15% of Caucasian. It is thought that this originated in Basque country uh, between Spain and France because the prevalence of D negativity is much enriched in this part of the world. So D negativity occurs again by deletion in 15 to 17% of people with European ancestry, but that is different in people with African ancestry, where denegativity is less common, but also produced by genetically other ways. Two-thirds of that three to five percent with African ancestry who were denegative have what's known as the RHD psi sequence. So this is a 37 base pair duplication. The last 19 exons of intron 3 and the first 18 nucleotides of exon 4. A third of people with African ancestry who were D-negative have the DCD hybrid. So there's a chunk of the CE gene that's taking the position of the exons shown in blue. You will see that there's a D Roman numeral 3 CD hybrid and this reflects the fact that this CE implant or trade-in event occurred on a base of a partial D, D Roman numeral 3 gene. So this was the base gene that then had the CE exon 4 to 7 insertion. Now, D negativity is quite uncommon in people with Asian ancestry. In some Chinese blood banks, at least historically, they would only put the abiotype on the label of the blood bag. There wasn't this pause neg attribute uh, because it was so predictable that your donor would be RHD positive. And if you have someone who is D negative uh, with Asian ancestry, it's possible that they're not truly D negative, but actually still D expressing, but at a level that is so low that it looks negative. Uh, and serologically, this is an interesting state that can be verified uh, with uh, multiple layers of serotyping and elution studies, uh, hence called DEL, D-E-L, where L is the abbreviation for the eluit or elution study done to prove adsorption of D-typing reagents on very low-level D-expression cells. So, 0.1 to 1% of people in Asia are D-negative, but about a fifth of those people are actually DEL, so truly positive and not negative as, as they may seem. So you can imagine that this means that D-negativity in a person with Asian ancestry has this one in five risk of actually being D-positive and immunogenic. So there's a strong incentive to figure this out. People who are D-negative will have maneuvers to confirm their D-negativity, such as after the anti-D-typing reagent gets placed in anti-human globulin on top of that to intensify uh, visibility of that reaction, uh, and then making an l of that material and running that against D-positive cells to see if on a higher density surface, you can prove that your eluit had landed on D to begin with. It is important to know that 99% of D-negative individuals reliably have the little c, little e version of the CE protein. And that haplotype is called little r. It's all lowercase if you're Rh-negative and uppercase r if you are a D-positive wiener type. 
Now, if you are D negative, but downstream was the big C little e version, then you are called R prime. If you are D negative and downstream, you are the little C big E version of the C protein. You are called R double prime. And if you are D negative and you have the big C big E version, instead of capital R subscript Z, you are called R Y. Okay. Again, 99% of D negative people are big C neg, big E neg. If you're ever in a pinch and you need to provide big C negative or big E negative blood because your patient has either of those antibodies, but you're in a low resource environment that doesn't have C and E typing reagents. You can always draw upon a D negative unit as your safest stand in to be assured with 99% confidence that you're giving your patient a big C negative, big E negative unit. So D negativity has some surrogate power to assist you in those circumstances. Now, if you are compound heterozygous or homozygous for a non low r d negative wiener haplotype then you have a rare blood type and you're praying to find an appropriate match this table here shows the classic haplotypes by continent and the percentages assigned with quite a bit more precision than what I've been cataloging or oversimplifying in the previous slides. And we have to remember that you don't inherit just one haplotype, but you inherit two. So uh, you can't stereotype someone as a single haplotype. Uh, many people are obviously heterozygous. So you can infer based on a person's ancestry and the commonest presentations of certain antigen arrangements what the haplotypes are likeliest to be. R1, R2 is much likelier than Rz, little r. Now, what is DNA variation? We have 25,000 variants per sequenced individual. If you have a variant that exists at less than 1% population prevalence, we often call it a mutation. But if it exists at more than 1%, we redignify it with a different name. We call it a polymorphism. Instead of having this value laden language, I like to just call these variants. The distinction for a different name usually is, is to honor the idea that if something has ascended to more than 1% population frequency, obviously it's statistically more important. It may reflect a founder effect or it may reflect evolutionary significance. So there may be a selection factor promoting its ascendancy. Now, we're not just SNP-based variants. There are structural variants that also generate additional variation in our genome. We've got about a thousand large copy number variants, meaning changes in the DNA that are bigger than 500 base pairs long. Thankfully, most variation is synonymous or neutral, not leading to major changes. The other point to make here is with all of this variation that each individual is expected to have, that we actually vary more person to person than the variations that cluster from race to race. So uh, this is uh, having this understanding of DNA variation is a very anti-racist insight in and of itself. So this shows you by range of involvement or length of change um, what our variations are classified as.
Okay, most of us have learned about SNP-based changes, single point mutations, but we know that you can have small insertions and deletions like the RHD psi. You can have short tandem repeats. There can be fine scale structural variation, retro element insertions, intermediate scale structural variations, large scale structural variations, and chromosomal variations. And up in that range is where you might see actual changes in a myelodysplastic person with their G banding cytogenetics, for example. So, again, over 99.9% .9 of changes are SNP based. They occur every 100 to 300 base pairs. Uh, and that means that we have millions of changes. We have over 2,000 structural variant type alterations in the human genome. So the bottom line for the blood bank, single nucleotide variants, wild type can flip to a missense in the sense of a silent synonymous SNP, a meaningful change that leads to a faulty protein from uh, an amino acid that has a biochemical impact on the folding of the protein and its function. When you have a nonsense mutation, you have an incomplete protein because you have a stop. And that can occur from a clear stop codon uh, or from frame shifts. So if you get these insertions or deletions, uh, you can mess up your sequence so badly that you just don't get the final protein in the wild type sense or anything that even looks like it. Splicing can also produce these incomplete outputs. Greater genomic structural variation. So classic example of deletion is the D gene deletion, or if you're D dash dash, the CE gene deletion. But what's going to pop out here at us in this RH section is what are known as recombined hybrids, which is where you get exons that are similar from duplicated genes, such as between D and CE, popping into each other. Okay, so that's what a recombined hybrid is. And you saw a picture of that with the DCED protein. When you look at diagrams illustrating DNA changes, you'll see lines indicating SNPs, but shaded sections when you have introns or exons involved and mutated, as shown on the right. So look for boxes and rectangles when you're seeing diagrammatic representations of greater genomic structural variation. Now, if you're faced with a variant of uncertain significance, or a VUS, we have to figure out whether this is important. And so if you have a variant of known significance and it's cataloged, that's easy. You've got your answer. But if you have a variant of uncertain significance, there may be ways to further subclassify. So it may be of doubtful significance if you know from the genetic code that the amino acid uh, predicts for identical function. You may just be stuck saying, I don't know. Or if you have a variant of uncertain significance, you can develop some confidence that it may have significance not because it's been reproduced in other people who share that, that change, but because there are clues shown here. Why is there RH hyperdiversity? So we've alluded a bit to this, but I'm going to show you this more clearly. Gene conversion or intergenic recombination will occur by new hybrid alleles producing new proteins, and that's parts of D into CE or parts of CE into D. And the whole reason this happens is that because you have a 5 prime, 3 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime arrangement, these genes, which look so similar to each other, can form a hairpin 
Uh, and at meiosis, there's an opportunity to structurally recombine these homologous looking sequences, though this is not what should have lined up. Okay, so this is this gene duplication produced a structural accident in evolution that has hereby lent itself to promoting even more variation. So a very fascinating kind of structural chemistry story in DNA evolution. Despite the fact that this arrangement exists in the RH system, SNPs still outnumber these hybrids when it comes to cataloging all of these variations. Now, what else does diversity imply? Whereas RH variants occur in about 1% of Europeans, they are much more frequent in Africans at nearly 90%. This is what's known as the out of Africa hypothesis. We can infer that the origin of humans is in Africa because in all of these migrations, there is less and less variation, less sequence variation the further out you go from this origin point. So, maximum diversity is likely to reflect the true foundation or source of humanity. But the founder groups, the exodus groups who populated other parts of the world represented narrow offshoots or selections of that time that worked in the past on DNA. So with time, there's more pressure and more chances to change. There are alleles of functional value, so malaria imposes selection pressures that can accelerate and select for certain changes. So there are DNA variations that lead to reduced parasite invasion. From our ABO session, we learned about reduced parasite adhesion. So if you mutate off your A or B expression and you're left with a blood group O type, Malaria-infected red cells do not adhere to uninfected red cells so well. And so that's a reduced parasite adhesion advantage that has selected for the ascendancy of the O genotypes. There's another anti-adhesive or adhesion-escaping phenotype, and that's being negative for the NOPS antigen system. The RH variation story has nothing to do with malaria selection. Again, the thing that drives diversity here is the structural accident of 5 prime, 3 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime, and gene duplication and homologous recombination, structural temptations. The problem with a lot of our DNA based research and the knowledge that we have today is that it has been fixated on or enriched for people with European ancestry, which will not be so revealing if they have less diversity than people with African ancestry. So this is improving. But you could see how dismal things were in 2009 with only 4% of DNA work coming from people with non-European ancestry. That's improved 19% in 2016. Now let's get to partial versus weak. So you might have seen the DU notation for weak D. So in this diagram of a red cell, uh, the D protein is illustrated by this little capsule called 1, 2, 3. And there's a certain density. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of these antigens on the red cell. Sequence 1, 2, 3. If you are weak, you have the normal sequence of the D gene, at least exofacially speaking. Looks just like the 1, 2, 3 on this wild type D positive person, but you just simply have fewer copies of that structurally normal D protein. That's what a weak D is. Okay? It's a quantitative problem, not a qualitative one. And where weak D causes trouble is if you have a blood donor or a baby who gets mistyped as D negative when in fact they're D positive. Obviously, if you're a, a 
misassigned D-negative baby born to a D-negative mom, you might make the mistake of not giving her Rh immune globulin. And if you have a seemingly D-negative donor who is actually D-positive, you could give that to a D-negative person and cause a D-zero conversion. And so weakness of D is a problem. The flip side is partial D. That's a qualitative problem. And so whereas the density of D can be just as high, this person can give you a nicely strong D-positive type. They are missing or variant at allele position too, just theoretically speaking. So they're, in that sense, partial. Can therefore make an anti, number two antibody if they get transfused with this wild type. And so these are the people who, despite their strong D type, their strong D positive type, can be imperiled as blood recipients. They can get assigned D positive blood and then make anti D. If this is a D positive mother, a pregnant person, they could make anti D. And as the consequence of not getting RH immune prophylaxis. What you can see from this molecular diagram is that the locus of mutations in people who are weak D is usually non-exofacial or membrane involvement or submembrane, and this will influence how you traffic or load your D-antigen into the red cell membrane at the end of the day. But again, exofacially, nothing wrong here. And so when this person sees these same exofacial loops in a high D-density donor, they just don't see them as different, and there's no reason to raise an antibody against those exofacial landing loops. On the other hand, partial or qualitative D mutations, as you can see, are all situated on the exofacial loops. This makes this person perceive their version of D as different from the wild type exofacial loops. A person with this mutation will therefore pick on the absence of that variant in the wild type D. So exofacial variants set you up not necessarily for reduced density of expression, but enough structural variation to provoke an anti-D against the wild type. Now it is possible to have overlap states. There are people who have both weakened expression and who are also exofacially variant. and That would be a weak partial or an overlap. You may also have D sequence variations and you don't yet know how to classify them. Maybe serologically they're weak, but you don't know if they belong here in the middle as a weak partial. So there continue to be some unknowns. Generally speaking, among D variants, 0.8% uh, of people are weak D and 0.2% of people are partial D from that roughly. 1% of people who are D variant. And about 5 to 10% of weak Ds will be partial or sitting here in the middle. So these are rough numbers, but again, they change all the time depending on who your cohort is. Because again, it's going to be very much influenced by whether or not you have good inclusion of people with African or non European ancestry. Now, at risk of making anti-D and thus having HDFN are obviously the true well, unambiguous RHD negative people, but also the false positives who could see a wild type D as if it's foreign. So numerous RHD variants are at risk of being a partial D state. A 10 to 20% of D positive individuals uh, with African ancestry may actually be D variants. Uh, who would be enriched for partial D states and thus the risk of making anti-D testing platforms and indications. But what about the possibilities of D variation in the middle? Okay, Not the wild type D, but the possibility of non-wild type D at risk of seroconversion or not. So the RHD question mark person is a seemingly D positive person who's made an unexpected anti D. Anyone whose D type has changed from hospital to hospital or from within a hospital as 
reagents or testing modalities may have changed. So positive in one instance, negative in another, mixed field, weak D-type, this sort of thing. Anyone with African ancestry. And then surrogates of that. So individuals with these surrogates of African ancestry are entitled to some genetic resolution of whether or not they are an RHD question mark that needs to sort in one direction or another. What the genotyping does is tells us who lands on the right, okay, which D question mark states get to be treated as D positive, where you don't have to worry about assigning D negative blood and you don't have to worry about giving rig. This is limited to people who are weak D type 1, 2, or 3. So Arabic numerals type 1, 2, or 3. I put a question mark for because not all people agree that weak D type 4 can and should be treated as a D pause uh, simply because a number of us have experience with so called weak D type 4 who have made anti D. The assumption is that weak D type 1, 2, 3 is not alloimmunizing. The simple dichotomy here is any other variant other than a normal D who's made anti D, any other variant belongs on the left. Okay. Everyone on the left, this seemingly normal D sequence who's made an anti D, the D variant that is not type 1, 2, 3, and therefore at risk of making an anti D, anyone is otherwise landing on the left as potentially alloimmunizing. And this includes RHD question mark while you're waiting for the test result. So if you have an indeterminate blood type and it's not yet genetically resolved or classified, the precautionary principle would have you treating that person as a DNEG, unless this is a person whose D seroconversion would not be troublesome to you or the patient. These are the individuals who get RHD immunoprophylaxis and served with blood from RHD negative donors when it comes to red blood cells and platelet transfusions. Now, I've alluded to the fact that sometimes we cross the D barrier even if someone is D negative, and that's increasingly by exceptional but carefully negotiated circumstances. Again, this is where the risk or the impact of HDFN gets increasingly discounted or eliminated by that person's demographics. Now, some massive hemorrhage protocols and traumatized D-negative individuals do produce lower seroconversion rates. You could see that this is lower down at 15 to 30 percent, probably because trauma itself it is an immune suppressive event, you still get a substantial seroconversion risk. When it comes to the contamination of platelets with D-positive erythrocytes, because remember, platelets themselves do not express the D-antigen, you have a much wider or noisy range of variation for the possibility of seroconversion, but still 5 percent is quite a seroconversion risk if you are a person with childbearing potential. So these are examples of numbers that we normally wouldn't tolerate or accept if you have a person with childbearing potential. However, if you have a person whose uterus is out, a person who doesn't possess a uterus, if they are non-reproducing in their future, then need you worry about a D seroconversion? Technically, no. D is literally the easiest thing to match for because it is an attribute that's on the label. So as long as your D negative supply is adequate and you believe it will be adequate in the future, making an anti-D after an emergency D positive blood unit exposure or numerous units exposure is not a big price to pay. It's easy enough to provide D negative blood to the person who's made anti-D. And remember, Making that anti D is not something that will happen quickly, typically in a primary seroconversion. It could take one to three months. So you have time to spare. You know, by the time the emergency release D positive transfusee has made their anti D, the, an 
the deposit of blood is long gone. So some interesting numbers here. If you are an immunocompromised hemonc patient, instead of having an 80 to 100% or 15 to 30% risk of D0 conversion from a deposit of blood unit, the risk is closer to 7 to 23%. And some centers believe this to be an acceptable risk. And so there are some hemonc patients, for example, if you're at MD Anderson and you are past childbearing or a cisgendered male, uh, then you may be served D positive blood for the sake of conserving that limited D negative supply because, again, the chance of making anti D is low and the downstream price of having made so one to three months from now, especially if you might be palliative, uh, is immaterial. When it comes to platelets, platelets have an even lower risk of causing D zero conversion. So if you're up to one and a half percent, do you really need to give? an Rh-positive platelet with an Rh immune globulin to a 65-year-old lady with cancer or an 85-year-old man? Probably not. And the price you pay if you give Rh immune globulin to a D-negative person who doesn't really have a lot to gain from it is that you've now rendered them screen positive. So they have somewhat more involved groups and screens and cross-match workloads uh, the timing of sample submission needs to be a little more advanced in screen positive people. So you do mess up the logistics a little bit here if you render a previously screen negative person screen positive by passive immunoprophylaxis. Let's come back to molecular typing, which is today targeted SNP arrays as we do them. So I mentioned, again, this is a duopoly, and this, this was previously kind of spread out across Canada. Um, here in Ontario, uh, we have and have had the Griffles platform in Ottawa, the National Reference Immunohematology Lab, and now here in Brampton. Uh, and so the ImmuCore uh, platform, the hardware and software and so forth, previously in Alberta, uh, would run uh, those particular versions of the genotype in, because here in Ontario, we didn't have the uh, D-typing. We would just do the 37 red cell antigen core XT if we wanted to reflex a D genotype on someone who has African ancestry as picked up from the history or from the minor antigen profile genotype. We would ask or have done in Alberta then the corresponding RHD DNA work. Uh, this is now consolidating here in the Brampton area. Uh, and so we have the capacity now to uh, run this testing locally and in a parallel or unsplit fashion, which is nice. So, so these are some uh, kind of cohesion and efficiency developments. Now, systems of concern when it comes to high variation, as mentioned, are the uh, Wiener system. And again, you appreciate now why that is. But I would like to now allude again to the glycophorin system. So that's where your MNS types are expressed. So the glycophorin A, B, and E genes uh, are on the long chromosome of 4Q. And these are also. Uh, duplicated and uh, similar looking gene sequences that have been at risk of other recombination events. So just to be mindful that there's a lot of glycophorin variation and the hot spots for observing this are in Africans and in Southeast Asia. Uh, so areas of malaria and demicity have really worked on the glycophorin gene because here these actually have malaria selection impact in contrast with the Wiener system. So what's driving hyperdiversity here is both structural as well as natural selection because glycophorin can be a portal of entry for falciparum malaria. Now, when it comes to next generation sequencing, there are some terms to know here. There's whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing and targeted next generation sequencing. And so you can target your sequences to specific genes. That's going to be a finite number of nucleotides to get information on. 
when you get whole exome sequencing, that's all of the coding genome. So four to five gigabases. Okay. The most comprehensive is whole genome sequencing. Much, much more DNA, obviously, because there are so many introns out there. This is going to give you information on coding and non-coding DNA, mitochondrial DNA, uh, and major structural variations, copy number variants, indels, and um, small nucleotide variants. Okay, so this is much more comprehensive than the information you can get going down the line. So obviously for cost, targeted next generation sequencing is more popular when it comes to specific disease arrays or for the work that a blood bank might be doing. So variants of concern. Let's look at some examples of DCE. So examples of D variants. So there's over 500 RHD variants. And there are 20 leaders, about a third of people uh, with African ancestry are going to be D altered. Partial Ds, you'll see Roman numerals. Uh, D, Roman numeral 3A, 4A, 4A type 1, type 2, Dow, Dow 3, Dow 5, Dow 1. There are over 150 RHCE variants and or variants among the varied. So three quarters of our patients will have a C gene alteration. The commonest C variants are those that express on the C gene the V or VS antigen. So you can see the 733G or the 48C with the 733G. There are also other variant CEs. So instead of the V series, you can have CETI, CEAR, CEAG, CEBI, CR, and CERN. You can be partial by trading in or missing out. So examples of DCED hybrids where you lose your D attribute, but you might gain a false big C phenotype that is partial and not protecting you from big C seroconversion. The classic example of that, again, is the DCED hybrid. Conversely, you can have CED, CE hybrids, so pieces of D within the CE gene. CR and CERN are examples of the false expression, the potential false expression of the D antigen by virtue of its exons present within the CE sequence. And so CERN is an example of a D implant in the CE gene that is going to weaken the big C little e. The implant here has occurred on the base of an R1-like background. So you are going to get a weak big C expression in CERN, uh, and someone with that particular phenotype should probably get genotype for the presence of this particular molecular variant. Now, other ways to get partial would simply be to have enough SNPs on your variant so that alter your gene. So this is uh, how you produce a variant without necessarily having recombined hybrids. The V or the VS antigen shown here, the 733G mutation, is a particular SNP that alters the CE gene and produces a variant little c variant little e on that allele. Okay, so this is about missing out a SNP variation that changes you as opposed to having gotten partial by recombined trade ins or substitutions, pieces of the contralateral gene coming in. So the request for consolidation and reconciliation uh, speaks to, wouldn't it be nice if you had all of these variants in a single assay rather than one assay having some and the other having others? So uh, the fact that we even have a split process between C genotyping and D genotyping is arguably problematic. And so uh, some of this is 
simply driven by that duopoly and what gets offered and what got purchased or developed at specific testing locations. Now let's look at partial E. So the locus for the big E versus the little E is here in a portion of the CE gene that sits in what's known as a vestibule. Uh, this is not jutting out so much as these other exofacial loops. This might help conceptually to explain why a mutation at the 733G locus, which is not the locus of the big E versus little e amino acid defining SNP, can nevertheless produce an E variation. Appreciate that the CE protein gives you many transmembrane folds and that you get these integrated or impactful structural changes when you tweak an amino acid at another location that's near enough by the vestibule where the little e locus would sit. So you don't have to have a mutation in the exact location of the E determinant to explain why you get things like partial little c, partial big C, partial little e, and so on. Okay, so exact locus is not everything, but the eventual immunogenic or tolerance engendering fold out of a protein is what ultimately matters. So let's look at the CE variants that give you little e variants and what they're often called by. So one important class of little e variants are the HRS or RH19 individuals and the HRB negative or RH31 individuals. Being negative for HRS or being negative for HRB speaks to the missingness of an aspect of little e-ness. Okay? You are fully little e if you have HRS and HRB elements to that e or that vestibule. So people who are HRS negative might phenotype like they're little e positive, but they can make an anti-little e-like antibody that is going to be called anti-HRS. And likewise, if you are HRB negative, you will type like a little e positive, but make an anti-little e-like antibody that is actually called anti-HRB. So some examples by name of HRS negative individuals are shown here. So CEK, CEAR, CEBI. Examples of HRB negative little e types, variant little e types, would be the classic CES version of the CE protein where you express the V and the VS antigen. Those people who, by the mutation, now have a V antigen have lost their HRB and are called HRB negative. The 733G mutation, which we see very commonly in our population with sickle cell, gives you the leucine to valine variant uh, amino acid change. Uh, again, all happening uh, within exon 5. Uh, the vestibule impacting part of little e expression. There are eponyms, so the HRS negative person who makes anti HRS, that's called Shabalala, and the HRB negative is the Bastion. There is another variant CE called SEMO that is both negative for HRS and HRB. So uh, a person who is SEMO homozygous is going to be very difficult to match blood for if they have made antibodies against both HRS and HRB elements. So here we are back to Mickey Mouse's head and his ears. Uh, wild type little E has normal small ears, but the little E variant who is missing HRS or HRB, has a section of their little e vestibule missing. Okay. This particular zygosity is protected by carrying one wild-type little e, so it doesn't matter that the other allele is missing HRB. The problem comes with the person who is a variant homozygote. This person who is HRB negative in the full sense uh, 
is vulnerable to making anti-HRB. They're going to type like they're little E-positive, but they can make an anti-little E-like antibody called anti-HRB if they get transfused with the typical little E, little E blood that's out there. Now, what is the R-prime-S haplotype? Well, that is a person whose CE gene is the CES version of the CE gene. Again, that's 733G mutation. And that is, is downstream of the D gene that is in the form of the DCED hybrid. And the big C is in brackets here because this is a false big C expression. So again, this is the person who types like a D negative from this particular allele. And they will falsely phenotype like a big C due to this implant. Uh, but will not be protected against big C seroconversion. So this is a DCD hybrid with the 733G. This combo is called R prime S. If you are homozygous, this is a person who, despite being big C positive, can make anti big C, and a person who, despite seeming to be little E positive, can make an anti little E like antibody with the HRBs. There's HRB, lowercase hrb, called RH31. This is less clinically significant than capital HRB, which is RH34. So these are the specific haplotypes that are at risk of making the clinically more significant anti-capital HRB. If you have this CES gene with a non-mutated D-type, the wild-type D, you are probably not going to make the more significant antibody, but the less significant anti-little HRB. And so the issue here is that this phase difference in notation can have an impact on whether or not you source HRB-negative blood for each of these sensitized individuals. The HRB exposure may not be as significant for the anti-lowercase HRB antibody maker as it would be for the anti-capital HRB antibody maker. Another unfair aspect of this confusing nomenclature is the difference between Vs and Vs's. So the V antigen is called RH10, and the wild type R0 setup shown here, normal D, normal little c, little e, is known as a Vs negative, V negative, wild type. It is the CES protein, as I mentioned, the classic CES that is VS positive, V positive. Okay, there's two ways to be VS positive, V positive with a normal D gene or the absent D gene, so no variance here. So fully there or fully missing. The VS positive, V negative individual, in contrast, has, instead of glycine at 336, cysteine at 336. Okay, so this is genotypically distinct. And therefore, these things produce different antigens and can provoke different antibodies. So a V is different from VS. These are called RH10 and RH20 an alternative nomenclature. So you're getting the sense here that these things get inherited as combinations due to linkage, due to gene proximity, and this is true. And the phylogenetics of Wiener variation has been worked out to some extent. We know that um, there are many variant CEEs that have arisen in connection to variant Ds. So again, this is why we are so adamant about if you pick up a D variant to reflex a CE genotype and vice versa, because these things are often co-inherited. You get a variant in one thing, you are much likelier to have a variant in the other. Now, variants are wild types as antigens. How immunogenic are these DNA changes in the RH protein, the ones that give rise to antigens other than the big C, little c, big E, little e? the ones that give rise to variant Ds, are these changes themselves immunogenic? If you have a variant donor facing a wild-type recipient, and what are the classic antibody names raised against these DNA variations? 
So what I want you to think of now is the fact that there's variant-driven anti-wild type antibodies, and this is how we've been thinking all along about partial Ds and partial big Cs and partial little Es. We've been thinking about the variation on the recipient side, making anti-wild type antibodies. Let's look at the mirror image of this now. Let's assume that the recipient is the one with the wild type and they are getting confronted with a donor who has the low prevalence RH variant because there's not a lot of these donors out there. Okay, There are donors who may have the RH variants. They themselves can be immunogenic to a wild type recipient. So how do I put that another way? Well, you've seen from previous diagrams that the partial Ds have their own unique names, often Roman numerals, here on the left. When you have a partial D, your DNA change produces a new antigen, and that can have its own name. So if I am a D-positive wild-type recipient of a donor who is partial D3A, that D3A is presenting to me the DAC antigen, and I, as a wild-type recipient, can make what's known as an anti-DAC antibody. Conversely, if I'm a wild-type D and I'm getting transfused with a D4A, they are presenting to me the Gonzalez antigen, and I can make an anti-Gonzalez antibody. If I am a wild-type D and I'm getting transfused with D4B type 2, who is presenting to me the novel Evans antigen, I can make an anti-Evans antibody, and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. So we're coming back to this concept of ISO versus allo immunization. ISO immunization is all or nothing. I'm group O or I'm A or B. I'm D-positive or I'm completely D-negative. If I completely lack a structure, I'm going to iso-immunize to that which I am missing. But uh, I'm going to allo-immunize in contrast. If myself and the donor share a protein, but me and the donor are just different at a SNP. Okay? And so if we have sequence variants that just slightly alter that protein, all those RH variants that constitute partial states give rise to allo antibodies. And so it's called the allo immunization if you're picking on a discrete number of sequence variants that are manifesting in amino acid changes rather than this all or nothing panoply of antibodies that the truly null or antigen negative person is making when they lack that whole structure or that whole protein. Now, what about the immunogenicity? Well, it turns out that there's a way to scale this, and this is something known as the giblet equation. And so if you compare the odds of making an antibody against the odds of making an anti-KEL for what's known to be a very immunogenic antigen, we know that KEL exposures give you a 30% seroconversion rate. If you compare seroconversion to a new antigen, to the seroconversion rate of KEL, you can scale the immunogenicity to a known immunogenic comparator. So I'll tell you the story of a lady we had here because we were wondering about how immunogenic things like HRB or HRS are to someone who might be lacking in those, you know, a partial little E. This lady whose ancestry we didn't know we were blinded to that. She was getting care of Princess Margaret as a person with myelofibrosis. So no clue there that she has African ancestry on the basis of that disease. But we realized very early on that she was a major immune responder. Within a month of her transfusion support, she made anti-Big E and anti-Duffy A. In the second month, they made an anti-JKB. And then in the third month, made an anti-KBA. She had typed as D-positive. And in the fourth month, she made an anti-D, even though she was D-negative. And when she made an anti-Big C, we were able to see from 
some reference materials, some pre-transfusion specimens that she was actually big C positive in her blood type. So that also didn't make sense. So in red now are two antibodies that she's making against antigens that she seems to herself serologically phenotype positive for. And then after that, she made a BG. So we ultimately got her genotype, and this is what we received as the result. On both of her CE genes, she has a CE variant. She's the CES version of the CE gene. And in terms of her D zygosity, she's got a DCED hybrid, which is not going to give us a D type on the blue allele. But then on the other allele, the pink allele, she's a weak D type 4. She's homozygous HRB negative. She's made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different antibodies. She gets transfused 110 red cells over an eight and a half year transfusion history. And not once did she ever make an anti little E like or anti HRB antibody, the one that her genotype predicted her for. So her case illustrated to me that the immunogenicity of HRB to an HRB negative person is much, much less than everything else. I can't criticize CBS for not offering us HRB negative blood to someone whose genotype says that they are HRB negative. It is not yet possible for us to give fully genotype matched blood. And I will accept that limitation in the meantime because this patient here taught me that HRB, even if you confront it, it's not a guaranteed seroconversion. So, how should we be matching? Well, Let's take a look at this patient here. They have D hemizygosity, or they are a variant Dow on one side and a wild type D on the other. And in their CE gene, unfortunately, they have two different CE genes that predict for partial little E's. What we are able to offer from Canadian Blood Services. To this person is a very unrestricted match. This person is big C negative, big E negative, partial little C, partial little E. So the best we can do is give them D positive blood that is negative for big C, negative for big E, and just cross our fingers and hope that they don't make an anti HRB from the wild type little C, wild type little E. The most exact match, of course, would be to find a donor who is genotypically identical, okay, a D with a DAO and a 733G with a 48C on two different alleles. The concept of haplotype match is a person, a donor, who is homozygous, haploidentical for one of the patient's haplotypes. They are sheltered within what the patient recognizes as self. So, this haplotype, homozygous haploidentical donor, will do just fine in the body of this patient. So that could be a D with a 733G or a DAO with a CE48C. Perfectly acceptable. An RH allele match flips the location of the CE variant so that the CE48 rides on the D side and the 733G rides on the DAO side. So this is a recombined variant, but still an allele match donor. So everyone in the top row who's been genotyped as a donor is a suitable substitute to the exact RH match. And then you can have some less restrictive matches here. So maybe one of the alleles is wild type, but the other one is molecularly similar. So the reality is that when we transfuse this patient here on the left, we're usually giving blood of this type on the right, but once in a while, because we are better diversifying our donor base and genotyping more and more of them, we might be getting anything from an exact RH match to a haplotype to an allele match to a less restrictive match. All of these are increasingly probable. Okay, we're back to the structurome, the schematic representation of our multi-protein complexes in the red cell membrane. So we are going to flip over to Duffy, which is this turquoise molecule present in the 4.1R complex. So I'm showing you a picture here of Duffy. It's got a flappy tail. 
And on the tail, this enzyme-sensitive tail, by the way, this is where the determinant of your Duffy A versus your Duffy B type sits. You can see that there's this exofacial epitope here labeled Duffy 3. The other name for the Duffy gene is ACKR1. That's the proper name. So I want to bring us back to the Duffy Vivax story. Remember, Vivax enters the erythrocyte through the Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines. So DARK is expressed on erythrocytes and on leukocytes. And it is the GATA promoter that influences the expression of DARK on the erythrocyte. Downstream of the GATA promoter mutation is your Duffy gene, which has the SNP that will predict for whether or not you are Duffy A homozygous, Duffy B homozygous, or Duffy A, Duffy B heterozygous. If you have the GATA promoter mutation, get non-expression. And if you're phenotyping this red cell, what looks like an apparently Duffy null erythrocyte because they test neither for the Duffy A nor the Duffy B antigen. People who have apparent non-expression of any Duffy molecules on the red cell have this apparent freedom from invasion. So parasites that use dark to enter the erythrocyte are plasmodium vivax and plasmodium nullsi, the more recent human-involving species of malaria. They both use this portal of entry. So this is an advantage if you want to avoid getting infected with vivax or nullsi. Now, vivax today is not a very lethal infection, but it's positive that it once must have been to have achieved such a high prevalence of red cell non-expression of the portal of entry. Nullsi, the more recent malaria species infecting humans, this has made a species crossover to affect us. This is um, a more sinister infection. So there is some advantage, at least, that we're armed with uh, for those who have this attribute. The erythroid transcription factor binding promoter is shown here in red. And the SNP change that gives you the GATA promoter binding mutation, depending on how you count, is called the 33T to C or 46T to C or 67T to C mutation. The SNP that defines whether you're Duffy A or Duffy B is located here at position 125. And this is where you're going to get your Duffy type readout. There are also these other SNPs that give you weakened versions of Duffy. So coming back to our GATA promoter mutation, someone who does not have the GATA promoter mutation, whose GATA works, will have erythroid expression. And so your downstream Duffy type, as determined by your SNP combination on your maternal and paternal allele, is going to give you a predicted phenotype. If you have homozygosity for the GATA promoter mutation, then you can predict erythroid non-expression, but your leukocytes will continue to express the version of Duffy that your SNP here will predict. The GATA promoter mutation developed or dawned upon the base of a Duffy B version of the dark gene in sub-Saharan Africa. And interestingly, the GATA promoter mutation independently developed in Southeast Asia, where it is upstream of a typically Duffy A version of the dark gene. So knowing your patient's ancestry uh, can help assign psychosity or linkage if you have only one copy of your GATA promoter mutation because these SNP probes are not running a long sequence to look at haplotypic linkage they are looking at these things separately. So your patient's ancestry information can help you infer what side your GATA promoter mutation is linked to. This is the heat map for the GATA promoter mutation. You can see how intense this is over continental Africa, up to 80 to 90% in some locations. So we're talking homozygosity. The Duffy non-expression in red cells like the O phenotype depends on 
both promoters being mutated. So in bold are the malaria-adaptive mutations where you need to be homozygous to see the phenotype and the advantage, but in regular font are the single-copy trait states that give you the malaria protection and know that when you get stacked into homozygosity or hemizygosity, you have the disadvantage. So sickle trait and thal trait, good for you in single dose, but bad when you are homozygous. And G6PD, which is X-linked, manifested in the male, but not so much so in the female who is just a carrier and protected by her other allele, unless there is a major lionization or methylation. Now, we want to be careful with our semantics. The Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines or dark non-expression, the apparent null state, the Duffy A neg B neg state, is actually the foundation of what was previously called benign ethnic neutropenia. There is a call to rename this as typical neutrophil count with Duffy A neg B neg status. This depathologizes. The term benign ethnic neutropenia, which is not actually a disease, but an explanatory state for a non pathologic neutropenia. So, what does this look like on your genotype report? If you only have one readout, this implies homozygosity. If you are GATA promoter mutated on a Duffy base, this is going to predict a Duffy A neg, B neg antigen profile if you were to serotype that person. Likewise, the minus 67C is the same thing as the GATA promoter mutation. What we would put on our antigen profile card, our phenotyping card, is that a person with this zygosity is predicted to definitely be negative for Duffy A because they have no Duffy A gene to speak of. But because they do have the Duffy B gene and they're homozygous for it, they are expected to be tolerant even though they might look like they don't have erythroid expression. And so we use the section sign here to indicate GATA silencing of Duffy B, which means you don't have to give Duffy B negative blood to this person, even though they might look like they're Duffy B negative. The genotype has just informed us of differential tissue expression, which should bestow upon them some tolerance. Now, what are the effects of nullifying red cell expression of Duffy? Well, the historic term benign ethnic neutropenia, though not pathologic, gives you lower neutrophil counts that may have led to different kinds of discrimination against people with neutropenia. So there may be impacts on chemotherapy schedules, on the withholding of schizophrenia treating drugs, and so forth. However, if you do not have the Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines on your red cells, there may be some impacts on your vascular biology or your bloodstream chemokine levels and correlating effects. So what is dark but for a portal of entry, not originally for germs, co-opted by germs, but originally biologically serving the function of being a chemokine receptor. The red cell biomass, if your five liter blood space is three or more liters of erythroid biomass, what the chemokine receptor is doing is being a sink for serum or plasma chemokines to enter the erythrocyte. So in essence, your red cell biomass is a huge shed or storage base or blood chemokines. If the red cell doesn't have the chemokine portal of entry, the blood chemokine levels can be much higher, and the effect of running much higher blood chemokine levels may be some of these downstream conditions or prices. So though we don't want to pathologize the lacking of the Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines on the red cells, there may be some other biologic impacts, so asthma and inflammation, loss of suppression of metastases, so different breast and prostate cancer outcomes, 
of course, there may be some racialization or other social inequities that are the basis of observed differences in these cancer outcomes. Uh, but there may also be impacts on HIV. So the susceptibility of HIV and the stability. So though there may be the bad news of being likelier to contract HIV for a given exposure, uh, there is a better expected response to antiretrovirals if you actually get access to them. By lacking the chemokine receptor and having blood chemokine levels, there may be higher rates of transplant rejection. So you don't assume that this is a patient who is not taking their anti-rejection medication. There may be a biologic basis to an increased risk of rejection. In having higher blood chemokine levels or having this GATA promoter mutation, homozygous appears to be associated with higher preeclampsia risk. And so it's possible that chemokines are the missing link to this, or that there may be some other polymorphism that's very co-segregated with that particular mutation. Now, what do you conclude if this is your genotype? So this predicts for this particular phenotype. Do you have to give this person Duffy B negative blood? No. This is a person who, because their GATA promoter mutation is the explanation for their Duffy B non-expression, the GATA promoter linkage to the conserved Duffy B gene expressed still on the leukocytes and on the endothelium means that you're going to be tolerant to Duffy B. So a person with this genotype and this phenotype needs no Duffy matching at all. Now let's look at this interesting case. We have a GATA, Duffy B homozygous, African ancestry patient with sickle cell. They type Duffy A neg, B neg. And because of that, we give them Duffy A negative blood that is Duffy B untested, so presumably positive. This person presents with a high frequency antibody that is reacting with all cells, including enzyme treated cells. They're reacting with every cell on the panel except for erythrocytes that are Duffy A neg, B neg. What is the antibody and how should we match her? And will genotyping help us? This antibody is clearly something that is landing on this part, the enzyme insensitive part of the Duffy molecule. This is not a blend of anti Duffy A and anti Duffy B because enzyme treated cells, which clip off the tail where this is expressed, are not invulnerable to the antibody that this patient has. The way that we should match her is to give her, likewise, Duffy A neg, B neg, red cells, because this appears on panel to be the only thing that evades the antibody that she has. So if you have an enzyme-resistant antibody that is landing on this part of the Duffy molecule, the only way to avoid that offending antigen these public epitopes, is to give blood from erythrocyte donors that don't express on their erythrocytes any of the Duffy antigen. What's interesting is that genotyping doesn't much help us. The people who are at risk of making an anti-Duffy 3 or an anti-Duffy 5, and we don't actually know what the landing pad is of the anti-Duffy 5 antibody. Uh, the Duffy 3 locus has been resolved, but the locus of the Duffy 5 binding site is not clear. Genetically, if you sequence the person who's made these antibodies, you find absolutely nothing wrong. No variants in the sequence. They're going to be Duffy B, Duffy B homozygous, and they're going to have the GATA promoter mutation. So the explanation for why they make this antibody is not clear. This raises the question of what other changes might exist, what post-translational modifications, or what structural expression impacts are there of how Duffy integrates with the rest of all of those antigens expressed on the red cell membrane? Is there something outside of the Duffy gene that influences how the Duffy molecule folds to make 
the person who has this variation, this mutation, looks so different from the wild type that they make anti-wild type, anti-Duffy 3, anti-Duffy 5 landing antibodies. So genotyping and sequencing don't help us, but genotyping, at the end of the day, just tells us the usual formula for this risk. Now, this risk is not high enough that we ask for Duffy A neg B neg blood in people with a GATA promoter mutation. A GATA promoter mutation liberates us from having to ask for Duffy A neg B neg blood. We only ask for Duffy A neg blood. But what it doesn't liberate us from is those people who, from this genotype, nevertheless make in those rare instances, anti-Duffy 3 or anti-Duffy 5, once you've made those antibodies, even though the genotype told us that you should be tolerant, the person who's made that antibody declares paramount what they need. And if their panel tells us that the only red cells they don't react against are Duffy A, neg, B, neg, well, then that's what we give them. So Jacob Pendergrast and Catherine Tubay presented at ASH uh, this very interesting study of four patients of ours who made anti Duffy 3. And what we did was take tissue from non erythroid organs. These were individuals who had opportunistically had other biopsies available. And what was done immunohistochemically on these other tissues was to see if they expressed the Duffy 6 epitope shown here. There was a commercially available uh, monoclonal antibody to detect the expression of this element of the Duffy molecule. And yes, it was conser conserved uh, in all of these patients. But what was interesting about this hybridoma raised Duffy 3 detecting epitope antibody was that the Duffy 3 antigen was not expressed in the other tissues. And so the people who made this antibody appear to either be hiding or not expressing this epitope to thereby explain why they made that antibody. So again, we don't have the explanation for what at a quaternary or intermolecular level is suppressing the expression of this exofacial loop, this critical tolerance engendering loop is gone, hence no tolerance, hence the development of anti-Duffy 3. So this may be a conformational antigen in conclusion. So let us conclude here. What have we learned? We learned about Duffy A neg B neg being a vivax resistant African ancestry genotype that preserves Duffy B expression in non erythroid tissues, predicting tolerance to Duffy B. But that tolerance is not guaranteed to the rest of the Duffy antigen receptor for chemokines. And sometimes a high frequency anti Duffy antibody can be made. And the only way you can circumvent this guy is to give Duffy A neg B neg blood. We've learned that RH is the most complex blood system after HLA due to intergenic recombination and the time that our most ancient human origins have had for random mutations. We've learned that D comes in weak partial overlap, weak partial forms and variants of uncertain significance that may or may not be at risk of antibody formation. So that those who've made antibodies are those who you want to defend from making them warrant care with D negative blood an RH immune prophylaxis if pregnant with a possibly D positive fetus or if getting RH D positive donor platelets. Genotypic resolution helps us to justify the use of these resources and appreciate that CEs also come in variant forms and they may be an increasing challenge to us with high frequency anti E like antibodies, but hopefully, again, the giblet immunogenicity of HRB and HRS negative people. Uh, should be low.